Good evening and welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York and to our Labor, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. I'm Victoria Dengel, the Executive Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City uh, Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. For those of you less familiar with the General Society, and by a show of hands, who has, it, it's your first time here to this building? Hmm. Wonderful, all right, a, a warm, warm welcome. Um, the General Society was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of New York City, artisans who represented 22 different trades, including carpenters, blacksmiths, saddlers, saddlers, tailors, and silversmiths, among others. Today, our 233-year-old organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through its educational and cultural programs, including our tuition-free mechanics institute, our Locke Museum, the John M. Mossman Locke Collection, the General Society Library, and our nearly two-century-year-old lecture series, of which tonight's lecture is a part. This evening, we are so fortunate that we were able to persuade our speaker this evening, Dan Hollihan, to come out of retirement <laughs> to share his consider we, we're not accepting the term uh, to share his con considerable expertise on the roots of radiant heating. And just to tell you a little bit about Dan Hollihan, he began his love affair with heating systems in. 1970 by going to work for a New York-based manufacturer's representative that was deeply involved in steam and hot water heating business. He studied hard, prowled many basements and attics with seasoned old timers and paid very close attention to what they had to say. In 1989, he left that company and began a journey as a writer that would lead to his becoming the international authority in steam heating and hydronics. One of the reasons Dan decided to share the knowledge he'd gathered was that he knew while older heating systems weren't going away anytime soon, the stories behind them and the information needed to make them work efficiently were in danger of slipping away. So Dan preserved this knowledge and shared it through his seminars, his books, and the wildly popular website founded with his wife, HeatingHelp.com. And just this uh, past year, Heating Help uh, .com celebrated its 20th anniversary, and his daughter, Erin, as many of you probably know, now runs the site. Dan Hollihan has written hundreds of columns for many trade magazines, as well as 22 books on subjects ranging from steam heat and hot water heating to teaching technicians. From Paris to Hawaii and, and from the Caribbean to Alaska, he has taught more than 200,000 people at his seminars. He is well known throughout the industry for his entertaining anecdotal style of speaking. And he's been responsible for helping many people solve tough heating problems in 19th century buildings such as the D Dakota on West 72nd Street and our own General Society building, which you're in this evening. It is now my great privilege to introduce to you Dan Hollihan. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and, th and thank you for coming out. I appreciate that. Hardly anybody wants to hang out with me anymore. <laughs> so in 1997, I stood on the roof of that building in, in Frankfurt, Germany, with, with a couple of friends and, and the uh, mechanical engineer who was responsible for its building. And this is the Commerce Bank, uh, the tallest building in Europe. And when it opened in 97, I was there just prior to wood opening. This was the most advanced building ever put up. They wrote books about this building. It was, it was astonishing what they did here. And when you see it today, for you, and wherever you are in Frankfurt, it's, it's very visible from every angle, but uh, it's hollow in the middle. And they've got these atriums as, as you go up. So if, if you're in there and you look straight down, you'll see the bank down below. And, and if you're down below and you look up, you see the sky. So it's a wonder how this thing is even standing when you see the way it's constructed. <clears throat> They put these uh, atriums on many different levels up, up through the building and they, <clears throat> they grow trees in there and, and part of that is to provide oxygen for the people in the building because this place works with open window ventilation as well as air conditioning. <clears throat> See the gardens? It's quite, quite a beautiful place. And that's one of the drawings that shows you the pattern of air going through there. But in 1997, 21 years ago, what astonished all of us was that this place had radiant cooling. 
metal ceilings that had groundwater running through it, and they cooled the whole place like that. And this was absolutely unheard of at the time. So here we've got this building that stands there in Frankfurt as, as something that's just modern and, and gorgeous and terrific. And when you're in Frankfurt, if you go to a place called Dom Romer, which is here, this is the city hall, you can see the Commerce Bank in the background. And, and uh, how old does this look to you? 14th century? 1950. That's one side of Dom Romer, this is the other side. 1950, the reason being? The war. In fact, when I, I, was, I was over there uh, every other year for 26 years, and, and it was to go to a big show called ISH, which is the biggest heating show in the world, 2.6 million square feet of stuff. And the first year I went, in 91, I met an engineer at the show, and he heard my accent, and he says, are you from New York? I said, I am. He says, I've been to your city. You people are pigs. I said, well, what makes you say that? He says, you heat your building with steam. That's 19th century technology. I said, well, we have some very old buildings. He said, old buildings. I have underwear older than your buildings. <laughs> you should get rid of it. I said, how do you just get rid of it? Oh, you can get rid of it if you have the will. We got rid of ours. I said, well, actually, we got rid of yours. <laughs> if you recall. He says, yeah, that's true, that's true. So they, they built this one section called Don Romer, and, uh, and they, they built it mostly for the tourists, and it's what's on all the picture postcards, but I love to go there. And, and in 1981, 1991, a couple of friends and I wandered into this little corner bar here called the Binding Schieren. Binding is the beer of Frankfurt. Germany has, every city's got their own beer, and Binding is the beer of Frankfurt, and Schieren is the name of the museum that's, that's right over here. So we went in there in 1991, and there's only eight stools in, the, in this little place, this tiny, tiny little bar. And these three stools were available. So we sat on the three stools, and, and there was some fellows sitting on the other five stools, and, and, and we met uh, Ella, who was the Polish bartender, and, and we struck up a conversation, even though she spoke no English at all. But we did kind of a pantomime thing, and, and we, we ordered beer, which in Germany is pronounced beer, so that's why we ordered <laughs> beer. And, and we, we then began to pantomime, can we buy you a drink? So this turned into an afternoon that was unforgettable because Ella, Ella pantomimed and, and the other fellas, some of them spoke English, so that got us through the day. We went away, came back two years later and found this place again. We walked in there and those three stools were available and the same guys were sitting at the other five stools and Ella was behind the bar. We did this every two years for 26 years. And every time we walked in there, those guys were in that bar and she was behind there. And when we walked in, it was like old home week. We'd start all over again, hugs and kisses, and we sat down and spent the whole day in there. And no matter when we went back, that place never changed. It was a place where time stood still. And there are not many places in New York or in your life that you can go back to 26 years later and find it's exactly the same as it was. But there was a magic about that particularly with the Commerce Bank in the background. Because here's something so modern, some, and, a, and a place where time stands still. And then what made it even more delicious was right around the bend here by the Shearing Museum is this ruin, which is a Roman house. And this is called a hypocaust. This is very, very early Roman radiant heating. And you find this all over the city. They would build a fire, and they would let the flames go underneath the floor and it would vent out through the walls. And this is how they heated their baths and how they heated their homes. So it's very, very early radiant heating. In a place where the bar, time is still, the Commerce Bank is the most modern building in the world and right around the corner is Rome. All you have to do is open your eyes and pay attention, folks. It'll talk to you, it's everywhere. And I thought that was so old until I learned about the Chinese Kang heater, which is basically the same thing. It's a table where you, you eat at during the day and at night you put down your blankets and you sleep on it because there's a fire going on under it and they vent it out. And this has been in China for so long. Uh, you could sit on there and smoke your opium. Nice, huh? And even today, if you go there into the rural areas, you can sit on a, go to sleep on a Kang heater. 
So everything old is still there, still with us, and it's all radiant. I did some research because I was interested in knowing where was the first place where they used hydronic radiant heating. Radiant heating done with, not with flame, but with water. And I found it in, uh, in Liverpool, England. And it is the Royal Liver Building, which in 1911 was given a radiant heating system. This is the world's first reinforced concrete building. It's also the birthplace of life insurance. And the Royal Liver Building had 119,000 square feet of radiant walls. And this was done in 1911. What troubled me about that was how the heck did they move the water around in 1911 when the circulator doesn't appear until 1928? The centrifugal pump that we use on these jobs shows up in 1928. Here's this building that certainly can't work on gravity. It's too big. So I get in touch with my friends in England who are historians in the heating world like I am. And nobody knew where that came from or how they did that. There were no records of that, how it was done originally. So again, you keep digging. You don't give up on this stuff. You keep digging. And I come across this article. Oh, I'm sorry. I come across this article of the East River Homes, which is on Cherokee Place between 77th and 78th Street. I grew up in this building when I was a little boy. And this building had hot water heat, which I believe in 1911 when it was built, was probably the first big hot water heating job ever done in New York, and perhaps in the United States. And this was built by Mrs. Vanderbilt for people that had tuberculosis. And I remember as a four-year-old, these windows that went from the floor to the ceiling because we faced east, and I remember my mother, how she looked in that light in the morning when she dressed me for, to go off to, to school and, and, you know, as I was growing. And I never knew why those windows were the size that they were. And I find out that, that because they built for people with tuberculosis, they paid 18% more to build than they would have paid if they were doing it with steam. And they had to allow more space to the radiator because the hot water was not as big, I mean, you know, not as hot as, as the steam radiators. And they did this because the hot water heating system was cleaner in terms of the air. So there were no vents spewing out steam or vapors into the room where the people had tuberculosis. So to think that I grew up in New York and the first building that was done with hot water to me seems kind of appropriate, doesn't it? <laughs> this is the Royal Liver building and they had these metal walls, these trays that were filled with a material called Dorado, which is like terrazzo. So it's a stone material. And in 1970, they replaced this. So you could see here the panels on the ground, and you can see the pipes back here. And there's an air damper here and an air damper there. So the air comes in and rises above it, but it's mostly radiant heat that's coming off this. So this is your first hot water heating system done with radiant. 1970, they replaced that with, with uh, European-style panel radiators. They raised the floor, and that was done. One year later, we see it go up in 1912 in London on the other side of, of England in the Third Church of, Christians, of Christ Scientists. And this is done with ceiling radiant. And in the early radiant systems, they, they did them all in the ceiling because it was just easier to do because you could run much hotter water. So that same year, or the following year in, in, uh, in London, in the Bank of England, they did this job. And you could see the wrought iron pipes there on the, on the roof of the uh, the dome, and they did this because they could run 185 degree water because nobody's walking on the ceiling, except for Lionel Richie. And he's dancing on the ceiling, so thank you for bringing back the 80s. So then I started to wonder, like, when did this stuff jump the ocean and come to America? And how do you think that happened? When do you think we see it the first time in America? Hmm? No, no, before that, before that. And who do you think, after what you just saw, who do you think brought this to America? The first time we see it appear in America is in 1930, and it's in the British Embassy in Washington. And two of my daughters lived just a few blocks from there, and, and when I would go to visit them when they were living in the city, I would pass this, and I would always have a little tip of my hat to the British Embassy, because that is a ceiling radiant heating system as well, and I've spoken to people that have worked on that system. So this is 1930, it's still running, 
and that is your oldest radiant heating system that's water-based in the, in the country. You like that? Okay, so that brings us up now to 1933, where we have the invention of a material called polyethylene. At the time, really, the only plastic that was around was called Bakelite. That's that black plastic that they used to make radios out of and whatnot. And scientists were trying to come up with more plastics. How do we make plastics? So in England, they're doing some experiments where they're working with chemicals that have names that are this long, and they've got them in an autoclave under extremely high pressure, and they're trying to get this stuff to fuse together under the high pressure and temperature to make some sort of a new plastic. Well, there's an explosion in the lab. Blows up the whole lab. Doesn't kill anybody, but it destroys the whole lab. So they go back in and they're digging through the rubble and they find in the remnants of the autoclave this white plastic stuff, which they look at and they say, by golly, we just invented a, a new type of plastic. Let's call it polyethylene. And this is great stuff. They, they're looking at it and it's, 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 it's uh, durable and, it, and it's wonderful. The only problem was it was, a, it was a, a plastic that got mushy when it got hot. That was the problem. So they couldn't do too much with it. They could only work with it on coal stuff. So they said, let's make some more. So they tried for the next three years to make more of this stuff with no luck. So they bring in more and more scientists to look at it, and they finally get this one scientist who says, why don't we repeat the original experiment? Let's blow up the lab again. <laughs> so they did the exact same thing they did the first time, and lo and behold, there's the polyethylene again. They said, okay, now we know how to do it. We just need more labs. <laughs> Bigger autoclaves. No, they, they, they figured out that it was the introduction of oxygen when the stuff was at high pressure and temperature that was the catalyst that made it form. And after that, polyethylene goes on to become this major player in, in the world of plastics and in, and in the world of, uh, of radar because it's, this, is, this is an insulator and they begin to use it on radar and it plays its major role in the Battle of Britain because the, uh, the Brits had the radar and the Germans didn't, and they were able to see the Luftwaffe coming through the clouds. And so, so it, you know, this, the, something as simple as plastic does have this major part in, in, in uh, world history. I first found out about polyethylene when I was a little boy at the New York City World's Fair. I was just 14 years old, and I saw the uh, Moldorama. <laughs> Remember when everything used to be Arama? Moldorama. And, and you put your quarter in there, and it, and it, and it made this this mold, and, and it had that toxic smell to it, which was probably carcinogenic, but who cared? It was 1964. And, and, it, and it would drop this thing out, and you'd grab it in that little slot there, and it was like 300 degrees when you pulled it out, and you're bouncing it back and forth in your little kid hands, but it was plastic, and it was wonderful. Gosh, gosh, 1964. But back to, back to uh, 33 for a minute, because we're in the Depression now, right? 1933, we're in the depths of the Depression. And, uh, you know, there's not too much being built and everything's kind of slowing down because of the Depression. But in America, we've got a, a fellow who was building um, in 1933 these things that he called Usonian homes. And this was a man by the name of Frank Lloyd Wright, who's really the first guy to use radiant heating in, in houses. And he does this because he hates the way the radiators look. Because Frank Lloyd Wright would design you a home. He would also design you the furniture, and he would design the silverware and the plates and everything that went into that home. In fact, I, I toured his house out in, in uh, Wisconsin once, and they told a story about when he was doing a, a design for a very wealthy man, he put in a skylight, and then he, he had this chair built that was right under the skylight. And the wealthy man moved in, and he, he sat under the skylight with a book, and it rained, and the rain came through the skylight. So he called Mr. Wright and he said, this is not good. The rain's coming through the skylight. And Mr. Wright said, someday there will be a caulking to prevent that from happening. <laughs> so he says, what should I do in the meantime? He says, move the chair. <laughs> if that's what you put up with when you dealt with a genius like Frank Lloyd Wright. So the way he did radiant was like this. He used rod iron tubing. And I want you to notice, if, if you're familiar with radiant heating, that, that there's there's absolutely no insulation anywhere here. There's no insulation underneath the slab. There's no insulation. Uh, there's no vapor barrier. There's, there's nothing to prevent water from leaking down and not up through the floor. There's no edge insulation. And it's extremely close to the surface. So, so that when they put the concrete down, this tubing is like a fraction of an inch below the surface. What could go wrong, right? And a lot did go wrong with his houses. So that's the beginning of of radiant heating being used in homes 
it's to depression, and everything is very, very slow to take off because you also have to be wealthy enough to have Frank Lloyd Wright doing the design on this thing. Hardly anybody else was doing this. So we roll up to the war, and 1940 comes along, and now we're, now we're in war, and, uh, and we need metal. So prior to World War II, according to the US Census, 50% of the buildings in this country were heated hydronically. They were heated with either steam or hot water, 50%. The other 50% either did not have heat, or they heated with stoves, or they heated with gravity furnaces, because forced air heating doesn't come into play until after the war, really. So half the buildings in this country that had central heating were hot water or steam heated buildings. That's before the war. During the war, we're trying to get more metal to build things like bombs and planes. So they tell people, go get metal. And they've got these metal drives going on all over the country where they're ripping out things like radiators. In fact, if you go to the Henry Ford Museum out in, in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, they have one of those signs there where they're encouraging people to rip out their radiators for the good of America. So people were doing this. So, so you, and, and nothing is being manufactured in the world of heating during World War II. Everybody that was making something prior to World War II that had to do with heating was in the business of making stuff for the war. So we see nothing new being made. So then the war is over and, the, and everybody comes home and it's beautiful and wonderful and, 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 and the next thing you know, we've got all these babies. We've got all these babies. <laughs> you know what I love about this picture? All these babies in that hot radiator. How many of those kids do you think touched that radiator? <laughs> Everyone. How many times did they touch that radiator? Once, right? That should be good enough. <laughs> good enough. So then uh, a few more years rolled by, and we, got, we come up to uh, 1956. And this, this plays a major role in, in the world of heating, the Interstate Highway Act. The reason why it plays a major role in heating is before this, people basically lived in cities or they lived outside the cities and farms. There really were no suburbs like we know of them today. So if you needed to travel, you know, you travel by train or you travel by bus because the roads were horrible. So Eisenhower decides he's going to build this system and pushes it through Congress for the sole reason of giving people egress in, in the event of nuclear war. So this is during the Cold War. Everybody's afraid of the bomb. When I was growing up, you know, we had to duck and cover. We had Pete the Turtle, and you had to get under your desk and then wait for the flash to come and then get out and brush the radiation off yourself and go home. <laughs> and then that's what they showed us in these movies that they played in school. So they build this highway system that, to me, is one of the incredible wonders of the world. Because when I was born in 1950, none of those roads were there. All of this was done in my lifetime. And that is astonishing that we were able to do something like that. If we tried to do this today, we would talk about it for 68 years. <laughs> and as soon as they built that, what happened then was people said, hey, let's get out of the city. Let's, let's go out into the suburbs, because now you've got suburbs, and we can have our little American dream out there. We can have a house. And they begin to build these cookie-cutter houses, and, and they go up, and they're popping up all over the country. And, and you know, the people that were moving into them were people that were coming back from the war, and nobody really knew about what was comfortable. You know, you, you grew up either with no heating, or my parents grew up in, on the Upper East Side with, with a stove in the kitchen. They didn't get steam heat or hot water heat until after they were married. So they didn't know that they were uncomfortable, but to, but to move into one of these new houses, it probably had a furnace, because a furnace is always going to be cheaper than a boiler. You know, they were delighted. Delighted to have a furnace. So just about all the new building that goes on after World War II gets a furnace. And hydronics drops down to 11% right after the war, where it has remained ever since. It's 11% of the heating market. It is what we call a profitable non-growth business. No matter what you do, you're not going to make this any better than it is. And as New Yorkers, you probably think everybody in the country has hot water or steam heat. As soon as you cross that Hudson River, all you see is furnaces until you get to Detroit. <laughs> but not all of them were like that, because some people were lucky enough to have hydronic heating, and some people had radiant. Like this guy here, look at this guy, this American dad here sitting in his easy chair. Let mama squat. I got the baby in my lap. I'm going to blow smoke in her face. It's OK. It's OK. And I got this warm floor, because I'm living here in Levittown. And I got this warm floor. 
So radiant heating starts to take off after the war, but not everywhere in certain areas. And they're trying all different types of things. They decided they were gonna try copper tubing for a while, and they would use uh, soft copper, and they would bend it into these molds and then drop it and pour concrete all over it. And they said, hey, why don't we try doing it in the walls? It'll work just as well in the walls or the ceiling as it will in the floor, and we can make the water even hotter. Won't that be nice? So you got copper tubing going on. You've got, in the case of Frank Lloyd Wright and others, wrought iron tubing, which is pliable and bendable. And then this other thing appears when, when the copper becomes scarce and the iron becomes scarce, they start to use this stuff called Bundy Weld, which came out of the automotive industry. And it's kind of like a pipe that's layered. You know, you've got these different materials sandwiched together and they pushed it for radiant heat. And they said, this is great. You can put it in the ceiling. And many, many homes wound up with this Bundy tubing, which today pops up all the time, particularly like on the Heating Help website where people will say, uh, I got this pipe. What the hell is it made out of? You know, because I can't solder it. I can't hook anything into it. And we say, welcome to the world of Bundy tubing, which only lasted for a few years and it was a disaster. But there's still stuff out there left over from that. So we needed to have somebody doing some serious research at this point, and that brings us to a fellow named uh, T. Napier Adlam, who in 1947 writes a very, very good book, very famous book. It's not a scarce book, but, uh, but it's a very thorough book called Radiant Heating, Radiant Cooling, and Snow Melt. And I got a copy of this years ago, and I sat down and I read it, and I learned so much from this man, because he began to talk about the human body as being a radiator. As you sit here tonight, each one of you, as a living person at rest is producing about 500 BTUs per hour. That's why it gets stuffy in a, in a closed room if there's not ventilation. So you're producing 500 BTUs per hour, which is enough to keep you alive. Right? So 100 BTUs you need to, to keep your lungs breathing, your, your diaphragm moving in and out, and your heart beating. That takes 100 BTUs per hour when you're at rest. The other 400 BTUs is a safety factor, which must be gotten rid of, otherwise you're gonna overheat, and you're gonna die. So 100 BTUs gets lost by evaporation. So we breathe out, in the winter you can see your breath, that's water coming out of you, it brings BTUs with it, and we perspire. When you perspire, your body temperature drops. That's why we perspire, to drop our body temperature. So 100 BTUs gets lost by, by convection, I'm sorry, by evaporation. Another 100 BTUs per hour gets lost by convection. That's why you could sit if it's warm and you could fan yourself with the program and you feel cool. Now you're not changing the temperature of the air when you do that, you're just moving more air across your body. So it's sort of like you're turning your, your body from being a radiator into a fan coil unit. You get more BTUs coming off. But the rest of the BTUs, fully 200 BTUs per hour gets lost by radiation. So when you are next to something that's cooler than you are, you will radiate heat toward that thing. This is why after the marathon has finished the race, they put those silver blankets around them. No, it's not to insulate, but that's to radiate their body heat back onto themselves. So you are a radiator. And Napier Adlam did the original research on this stuff in that book, and they measured people's body temperature. So you're 98.6 on the outside, but on the, I mean, sorry, on the inside, but on the outside, just about everybody in this room is 85 degrees. If we had more time, I'd walk around with a thermometer and touch you like he touched the lady in his office here, but today that's called sexual harassment. <laughs> then it was called scientific exploration. So you can see this most clearly if you want to really understand radiant heating by going to the supermarket. And when you walk into the supermarket, get yourself a cart. You don't need to buy anything, but you have to have a cart because everybody needs a cart. And walk around the supermarket. And, and go get yourself a thermometer. Go over to the gadget aisle and pick up one of those thermometers. You don't have to buy it, it's free. It's right there, just go get it. And you're gonna see that the temperature in the supermarket is 72 degrees. Yeah? So it's 72 degrees in that aisle where the gadgets are sold. Okay, take that thermometer, put it in your cart, and walk over to the produce aisle. And notice how you begin to feel cooler in the produce aisle, because it's all this cold stuff. Look at the thermometer. It's 72 degrees you feel colder because right now your body is radiating heat toward the produce. You're making the lettuce warm. Now walk over to the frozen food aisle and notice how you really feel chilly, especially like in the summer when you're in there with a short sleeve shirt and shorts, you really feel cold in that frozen food aisle, but look at the thermometer. The temperature is 72 degrees in the frozen food aisle. The reason why you feel cold is your body is throwing BTUs away from itself toward these cold surfaces. This is the phenomenon that Napier Adlam called cold 70. 
It's a sensation you get when the surfaces around you are colder than you are. So you're 85 degrees on the outside, that's 30 degrees. You're radiating heat toward it, it gives you a sense of feeling discomfort. Now go over there to the deli island, stand in front of the rotisserie where they're cooking the chicken. And notice how you suddenly feel warm on this side of your body. Back side of your body feels the same. Turn around if you want to be done on that side, you feel warm there too. <laughs> Look at the thermometer. It's 72 degrees right there and you're feeling warm. Or go over here. Now, I love this wacky store. Look at this. They've got, the, uh, they got the, the chickens here cooking right next to the freezer. That's effective, right? Put the hot stuff next to the cold stuff. So you stand over here and you're going to feel hot. You stand over here, you're going to feel cold. Your body is that sensitive. But the air temperature remains 72 degrees. It's just the way it works. Ask the valet to bring your car around in the winter and you're standing under those heaters and it might be 20 degrees outside and you're feeling fine because you're under these toasters. That's radiant energy. It's affecting the way your body loses heat. Or sit next to a really cold window or in a restaurant where they seat you by the window and it's so nice in the winter and you're freezing or, or you got the window seat on an airplane at 38,000 feet and the side of your body is frozen because you're so near that cold glass, that cold wall. This is what he discovered and wrote about in 1947. So we've known about that and we knew about it at a good time just as the radiant heating is beginning to take off again after World War II. Roll up to 1957, I came across this article about plastic pipe, is it, is it good for panel heating? And here they were talking about polyethylene tubing. And the problem with polyethylene tubing was if the controls are not that good, the water's liable to get too hot, and polyethylene is a thermoplastic, so it's going to get mushy and, and leak. So in this article, they explain all that, and they also had a bit in there where they said that, that Bell & Gossett, which is a manufacturer of, of heating equipment located in Morton Grove, Illinois, put in a snow melt system using plastic pipe in 1957. They talk about it in this article. And when I saw that, I said, my goodness, that's probably the oldest snow melt system in America. So I called my friends at Bell & Gossett, because I used to work for their rep, and I said, I said, tell me about this snow melt system. And nobody at that factory knew about it. And then they called old people that were retired and had worked there, and none of them knew about it. But somewhere out there in the concrete is a snow melt system that goes back to 1957. Ah, and then we get the Beatles, 1965. You could go see them for $4.50. Wasn't that amazing? So, so I, I show you this because it ties in with 1965 because more important than the Beatles that year was the invention of PEX piping. PEX is an acronym that stands for polyethylene cross-linked, P-E-X. It was invented by a man named um, uh, Thomas Engel. Drew a blank there. And I met Mr. Engel in Sweden in 1990. I went to a symposium there because a company called Wurzbo, which had his, his patent, he sold him the rights, uh, had just celebrated being able to circle the world 25 times with, uh, with this PEX tubing in 1990. So I met him and he told a story about how this stuff was invented because Thomas Engel never finished high school. Thomas Engel was drafted into the German army during World War II. He was captured by the Americans. He spent most of the war in a prisoner of war camp. And while he was in a prisoner of war camp, he read books about plastics. And when he came out, he knew a lot about plastics. And he starts petering around with it. And he finds, what he's trying to do is, is take the polyethylene and turn it into something that has all the good stuff that polyethylene has in terms of durability, but is also not subject to temperature. It's not gonna get mushy under normal circumstances. So he makes this major break, breakthrough in the early 1960s by getting the, the polyethylene molecules to link together chemically on the carbon atom. So it, it forms this material that he calls PEX. And this, is, this stuff has got this wacky memory to it. So if you were to make pipe out of PEX and take a piece of it and melt it with a heat gun, not with a blowtorch, but with a heat gun, melt it into a puddle and come back in a few hours, it will turn back into a pipe with the exact same dimensions that it started with. It is, it's like the blob. It's really spooky stuff. It really is. And I've, I've seen that happen dozens of times at trade shows where they melt this stuff down and it goes right back to being a pipe. So it's got this thermal memory to it. So it was something that was, that was great. And Engel never wanted to be in the manufacturing industry. He wanted to sell the patent. And he goes on to become fabulously wealthy at a very young age. Not bad for a kid that never went to high school. And then he goes into watchmaking and he makes some of the most beautiful watches in the world. And he's famous for that. 
And just before he died, about three years ago, he came up with a, with a, a machine that, that was spinning like perpetual motion. And, and it was, and he didn't, it was some kind of quantum mechanics, he said. He said, it's not perpetual motion, there is no such thing. But this thing was spinning and continues to spin in Geneva. It has not stopped moving. And it's this little motor that just goes and goes and goes and goes, and it's magnetic. So it just never stops moving. So he said he was too old to, uh, to research it any further, but somebody should follow up on that. So a remarkable life. And he comes out and he sells this stuff to, uh, to a company called Wurzbo, which is now called Upinor. And they begin to introduce it into the into European market and then into the American market, but first Europe. Because they look at this stuff and they said, this is pretty great. But um, uh, Thomas Engel explained to me that nobody wanted to buy this patent at first because they didn't see anything that they could make with this plastic. So he, uh, he went home and he was a little dejected. And then something special happened because his, his neighbor raised chickens. And the chickens, you know, to, to make them uh, more comfortable, they would put steel tubing underneath the chickens in the pens and it would make the ground warm and the chickens would like that and they would lay better eggs and more eggs. So one day the farmer came over to Thomas Engel and he said, I'm having a problem with the, with the pipe because the chickens poop on the pipe and it makes the pipe pop. Can you make pipe out of pecs so when the chicken poops on the pecs pipe, the pecs pipe won't pop? And he goes, pipe, I can make pipe. So, so he goes and gets an extruder and they extrude this stuff out and they put it under the chickens and the chickens are crapping all over it and it doesn't pot. So, so he goes to a pipe manufacturer, the biggest pipe manufacturer in Europe, which was this company called Wurzbo. And they'd been in business since the 1600s and they made steel pipe. And he walked in there and he said, I have one word for you, plastics. And, <laughs> and, and they said, why? He says, because it, when the chickens poop on the pipe, the pipe won't pop. And they said, Mr. Engel, there ain't enough chickens in the world to make this a viable business. So he says, but you, you, could, do the, you could do the radiant heating, and, and uh, that would be good. And they said, well, who, what good is radiant heating? He says, oh, it saves energy because it doesn't heat the air. It just heats the people. It saves a lot of energy. So now it's the early 1960s. Like, who? Well, the mid-1960s. And who cares about energy in the mid-1960s? You know, you, gas was cheap. Oil was cheap. You open the window if you're hot, right? So, so they sent him away, and, 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 but he's not going to give up. So he goes back and he says, you know what else you could do with this stuff? You could put it under a, under a soccer field and warm the turf. And that would be good for the players and extend the season. So now the people at Wurzbo go, well, now you're talking miles and miles and miles of this stuff, right? He says, yes. And he says, I'm from Germany, and we have an Olympics coming up in 1972. Let's talk to the Olympic Committee about us doing the Munich Olympic Stadium with radiant heat. And that is the first time that's done with hydronic radiant heating. 72. The following year, the most serendipitous event in the history of heating takes place, and that is the OPEC oil embargo. <laughs> Suddenly, we've got this rising price of everything. However, Wurzbo has this angle patent of this plastic that is very good for radiant heating. And based on Napier Adlam's work back in the 40s, we know that this stuff saves money and heats the building at a lower cost. So they were poised to go at it. Now at this point in 1973, most of Europe is heating with radiators like we use. They were all hot water. There's no steam in Europe. It was all hot water. So the, the radiator people are now saying, oh my goodness, the, the, the radiant people, they're working with temperatures of water that's down like in the 120 degree range. We need like 180, 190 degrees. So they're, gonna, they're gonna put us out of business. So we, we've gotta make bigger radiators. But if you make bigger radiators, that's gonna look kind of ugly. You know, it's, it takes up too much space. So they said, okay, we're gonna have to make bigger radiators with more surface area, but let's make them pretty. So they begin to explore the beautification of radiators. And this is some of what they come up with. These are radiators, as are these. This captures the imagination of the architects who say, you know, you don't have to see the radiators anymore. These are things of beauty. Look at this. You could turn a stair rating, a stair rating into a radiator. Isn't that fun? These are all radiators. That's a radiator. So in Europe, the heating people do to the industry what in America the plumbing people were doing for bathrooms and kitchens. Right? 
So those of you in the plumbing business, have you seen people spend $1,000 on a faucet? Right? right? But they wouldn't spend it on a radiator, would they? They would if they had this available. So this starts to change. And, and in America, we just keep doing the same old thing. But over there, they start to go toward lower and lower temperatures. And then they begin to legislate it. And they begin to say, in this year, the temperature has to go lower. And in that year following, it has to go lower. And they bring it down to like the hottest water you could send out now is about 150 degrees. That's the top temperature you're allowed by law to use over there. So this all works, the radiant, because heat doesn't rise. We know heat doesn't rise. Hot air rises, but heat doesn't rise. Heat radiates. That's why when you're standing under the toaster waiting for the valet to bring your car, that's heat coming down on you. Heat doesn't rise. And we know this, a great example of it was in Napier Adlam's book where he writes about the Liverpool Cathedral. Back to Liverpool here. Liverpool Cathedral was built from 1920 to 1961 with a, with a, a short break for World War II. And Napier Adlam shows this, uh, this in his book, this beautiful, beautiful cathedral. And they took temperatures, because it is a radiantly heated building. And it's not done with water, this is done with hot air moving under the stone. But here at the floor level, four feet above the floor, it's 60 degrees Fahrenheit. 97 feet above that is 58 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. That's the air temperature. So you got a one and a half degree drop in temperature over that height. Heat doesn't rise. Radiant systems heat people, they don't heat air. So in those early days with the controls, they used systems like this. It was very simple. They would just, they would just have a, a mechanical blender. It would sense the outdoor temperature of the air, and it would mix hot water with returning cold water. So some of the water that was coming back from the system would go right back up into the, into the job to lower the overall temperature. So it was a simple control like that because we don't yet have the good controls that we need. So let's move up to 1950, the year of my birth. And that year, Mr. Levitt was the Time Magazine Man of the Year. Because Mr. Levitt built Levittown. And Levittown was completely oil heated, and Levittown was completely radiantly heated. Because radiant heat was the cheapest system Mr. Levitt could find to put into his mass-produced houses. And we're right in the middle of the beginning of the, well, in the middle of the beginning, I mean, of the, the Cold War. And he said in that magazine, no man who owns a ha his house or lot can be a communist. He has too much to do. <laughs> 1946. Isn't that fun? So this is, this is a Long Island. And I know you're, you're all local, so you understand this. I have to explain this to people who don't live around here, that there's no distinction between towns. So I live where that, where that um, border is right over here. That's my house. And over here is, this is Plain Edge. This is Beth Page. This is Levittown. Hicksville is, whoa, whoa. Oh, oh, hang on. Hicksville is over the other way, over here to the left. And you cross the street and you're in somebody else's town. So when, when you're growing up, it's, it's just like this big suburban sprawl. And um, this is me in 67 when I graduated from high school. Wasn't I handsome? So 1967. And this is the year before 1966. This was the Battle of the Bands, and this is the, this is the Commandos. Played in every Battle of the Bands, and they always won the Battle of the Bands to play at every sock hop, every prom that we had throughout all of high school. And uh, these, these guys were great musicians. The guy playing the keyboard is uh, Billy Joel. So Billy Joel and I sat next to each other in most of our classes through junior high school and high school, and I remember him saying to me that someday he's gonna be more famous than Herman's Hermits. And I said, no way. No way. <laughs> so this is from our yearbook, and I remember this, uh, this night I was there at, at the, at the uh, sock hop with, uh, with my then girlfriend. She was from another school in, an, in another town called Westbury, which is right next to Hicksville, where I grew up. And he was singing uh, Felix Cavalieri's uh, um, Good Lovin' song. That's why he had the hat on. And during the break, he, uh, he came down and he saw my girlfriend, who was hot stuff, and he tries to pick her up, right? And she looks at him and she says, I like your music, but I'm with Danny. <laughs> well, the, ro the romance lasted another year. She did live in a Levittown house, though, and, and uh, they did have that warm floor. <laughs> Every time I see ready and tubing, I get a little twinge, I gotta admit. So, so it lasted another year, and I like to think that, uh, that she sits somewhere in America right now smacking herself in the forehead thinking I could have been one of those Mrs. Joel's. <laughs> so, oh, by the way, 
I'll let you in on a little something here. This is, this is a special extra. You know Billy Joel's song, Only, uh, Only the Good Die Young? You know where he says, come out Virginia, don't let me wait? That's Virginia. All right. Yeah. So Levittown gets built, 17,000 homes, and, and they were building 30 a day. So, so this, uh, this break here, you see, that is one day's work right there. 30 houses. Every one of these partitions is 30 houses. And they did this by mass producing. So there were people that did nothing but install doorknobs. I mean, everything was pre-cut, every piece of wood, every pipe, and delivered to the job site, and then assembled very, very quickly. So they built 30 houses a day, if you can imagine that. And the first house was sold on July 1st, 1947. People moved in, and this is all the returning GIs coming in. And, and it, was, uh, it was wildly funny because uh, the town of Hempstead, where this is located, is heavily Republican even back then. And they did not want the Democrats from New York City moving out because they were concerned that it was going to tip the balance of power. So Levitt actually appeals to the, to the federal government, saying these, these houses are for our returning GIs, and you know, you gotta let the, the people from New York come out, and, and they override the town of Hempstead, and they say, you, you gotta let them build this thing. So sure enough, the Democrats moved out to Long Island, and as soon as they owned homes, they all became Republicans. <laughs> so go figure. So, so people are moving in, everybody's moving in at the same time, it's just, it's just crazy, moving in day, and, and all the houses look the same. People come home from work, you know, they'd be half in the bag, they, they go to the wrong house. Imagine how many <laughs> marriages didn't work out just because all the houses look the same. My father used to drop me and my other Boy Scout buddies off in the neighborhood. We had to go door to door and sell stuff, and you know, he'd go to the bar and gonna pick us up later, and, and he couldn't find us. <laughs> So Levin was selling these houses, and, and they, they cost $7,990, and there were five different architectural styles, but they were basically all the same work, and there's no basements, and, and uh, you know, here's two different houses. The one on the left was the first Levitt offering, and the one on the right was a little bit more elaborate. It had a fireplace, and uh, all this took place over the course of four years. So Marianne and I lived in the upstairs of this house when we were married only about five years, I guess, and... Uh, and there was another couple living downstairs, and the landlord, we never saw, but, but this had radiant heat. And the landlord would frequently run us out of oil. And when we ran out of oil, Marianne and I wake up upstairs where there were convectors, and we could see our breath, and I'd go downstairs and knock on the door, and Al would answer the door, and I'd say, Al, we ran out of oil. And he said, we did? Because, you know, Al's living on this rock, which took a week to get warm. When you turned off the heat, it took a week to get cold, so he never knew we were out of oil. I had to tell him by coming downstairs. So Levitt had all kinds of ideas, and, and all the Levitt houses had sliding glass windows, and that idea came from Levitt going to, to White Castle to buy burgers, and the kid pulled the sliding glass window open, and Levitt said, what's this? And he says, oh, uh, it's a window? <laughs> and Levitt had never seen a sliding glass window, so he contacted the manufacturer, and he said, I want to buy enough windows for 17,000 houses. And also there was a shortage of, of lumber at one point and plywood really hadn't come into his own yet. So uh, he calls John Mansville and he says, I want you to make me a product that I could use for sheathing on my houses. And they come up with color bestus. This is sheathing made out of asbestos. Isn't this great? And everybody looks so happy to have it, don't they? The house we live in now is made out of this stuff. So everybody was so happy then. Look at this. Mama's there. Put the baby out in the front yard and go do your chores. It's okay. Nobody's going to steal your baby. This person would be in prison today, wouldn't she? <laughs> and this is the original floor plan on the left, and then they followed up uh, a couple of years later with the floor plan on the right. And the, uh, the fun part of it was that... Uh, <laughs> it got assembled like this. So, so here, there's the slab. There is no insulation whatsoever on the, on the edges or underneath. In fact, in Levittown today, we, we estimate there's probably about 8% of the houses still have the radiant heating system from the 1940s. And the way we know this is you go there after the snow. And within four feet of the house, there's no snow. And the tulips come up in February. I'm not kidding. Tulips come up. So I talked to my friends in the oil, he, oil business who service that area, and they're the ones that estimate it's about 6% of the houses left. So they deliver everything to the job and you assemble it. 
And here's the slab, how they, they put it in. Now, now they put down these two by fours to keep the, the tubing from slipping when they were pouring the concrete, and they used steel horseshoe nails to connect the tubing to the wood. So you pour the concrete there, there's no vapor barrier, this is right on the ground. This is old potato fields. So the wood begins to rot as time goes by, and as the wood rots, the slab settles, and the slab breaks those tubes. So now the slab begins to leak. That was the problem that they were facing. So there's Elvis pouring the, uh, not really Elvis, but I like to think it is, pouring, just pouring the concrete there, no insulation anywhere, nothing, just pour it right down there, and you're ready to rip. So, so a few years go by, and we roll up to 1958, and, and the plumbers on Long Island are all becoming multimillionaires by, by fixing those, those systems and the, the slabs with the leaks. And here's uh, Mr. Bauer in the penny saver. He shows where there's uh, the oil tank is buried two feet under the lawn. So it's two feet deep, a 275-gallon steel tank buried in the lawn. And now that nowadays, this is, they're like environmental landmines out there, all, all 17,000 houses, and a lot of people making money, you know, digging them up and putting, putting the tanks up here because we get our water from an aquifer. So that was a problem. And the way they made that work was they, they used a boiler that had a tankless coil for domestic hot water, and they had to maintain 180-degree water. And they did this by using a, a typically a, a circulator, whoop, 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 hang on, I'm sorry, a circulator uh, made by Bell and Gossett, and that would, gee, I'm sorry. Gosh, I'm giving it all away here. So there's the circulator, and it's pumping back from the tubing that's coming out of the floor, and some of it goes around the boiler and meets up with the hot boiler water going out. So there was a man named Erwin Jalinak who comes up with this idea that if we take a, a fitting and we put it into that T, and it was just a three-quarter by one-eighth inch bushing, if we put that into the boiler side of a, of a standard T, whatever would fit through that little one-eighth inch hole would go back to the boiler, and the rest of the water would bypass around the boiler. So in doing this, they knew that if we set the boiler at 180 degrees to make domestic hot water with the coil, we would have 140 degrees going to the tubing, which would give them 50 BTUs per square foot, which seems extreme, but keep in mind too, this was the time when people were using thick shag rugs. So they had to push through that. So that went on very well for years. What, what happened though was comical because the, the domestic coil would, would foul on the inside and you get less and less hot water. So you couldn't get a good shower, you couldn't get hot water for the washing machine. So they would call up Mean and Oil who had all these accounts. Levitt hired only mean and oil to do everything. And the mean and oil guy says, our contract, our free service contract that we give you doesn't cover the coil. So they said, well, we're gonna, you know, we're, we don't like that. So they said, okay, we'll send somebody over there and see what we can do. So they'd send over an oil man and they would crank the temperature from 180 up to 200, which would give them more domestic hot water. Because mean and oil is looking at that as a vending machine. That's not a boiler, that's a vending machine. Right? We sell comfort by the gallon. Right. So, so this was good. Everybody was happy. However, when you raise the temperature to 200 degrees, you're raising the temperature of the floor as well, because now you're sending like 160 degree water into the floor. So you got these black builders asbestos tiles that, that the glue melts and they come loose and you're kicking these things around like hockey pucks and the kids are, the kids are screaming, you can't walk on it, the, the pets are up on the, on the kitchen table. You know, it wasn't the easiest thing in the world to live with, but that's, that's just the way it was. And that's, that's the Levitt setup with the, you know, once we chop up the floor, that's what we find. And, and you can see the little balance fittings here going off to each ones. And then they put it all under concrete. <laughs> Brilliant, right? General Electric made one of the boilers that they used on these jobs. And GE was an oil-fired boiler that had the burner on the top that fired straight down and it vented out the bottom. And this sat, this 400-pound boiler sat on a, on a little metal shelf that was built into the chimney, which was also a fireplace right there in the kitchen. So when we take that cover off, that's what you look at inside. Isn't that horrible? How'd you like to service that? And then uh, they would replace it typically with this Wild McLean boiler. Wild McLean actually makes a boiler solely for Levittown to fit on that shelf. York Shipley made a boiler that was called a Low York. And that went into, into the, uh, uh, many of the houses. And when the York Shipley gets replaced, it gets replaced 
by this peerless boiler, which again is made specifically for Levittown to fit into that footprint. That's how big this business is for boiler replacements, because there's no gas in Levittown. So now when the, you know, these days, if the, if the tubing begins to leak, you, you can easily spot it if you use one of these flare tools and you just shoot down and you can see where the tubes are because it gives off the infrared radiation and you know exactly where it is. But back in the day, they didn't have that type of technology. And a, a plumber told me that uh, he, was, he was trying to find the leak one day and he was crawling around listening with the back end of a screwdriver. He was listening for water spilling out of the tube. And, and he says, the woman kept asking him what he's doing, what he's doing, and, and you know, he was trying to listen, trying to focus. So he, so he explains to her, the water's coming out of the tube sideways and, and not going straight. And that's, she says, oh, I, I could find that for you in a minute. So he says, oh, well, you know where it is, show me. So she says, you know, I mop the floor every week when the, you know, the kids are outside, and, and, uh, and I notice the way the floor dries, it, it was drying like in these lines. That must be where your pipes are. But over here, look, this was never there before. It was drying like in a big circle. Is that where it is? So he tells me this, and, and I said, that's a, that's a great thing. He says, yeah, and we started to find them by mopping the floor rather than crawling around with the back end of a screwdriver. So this was like 1990 or so, and I'm, I'm writing for a trade magazine, so I tell this story how to find the leaks by mopping the floor, and I take full credit for the idea. <laughs> Because if you, if you steal from one person, it's called plagiarism. But if you steal from many people, that's called research. <laughs> so I was big in the research. So, so I wrote that in a magazine article, and some old timer calls me up and he says, okay, big shot, what did we do in the rooms where there were rugs? So, uh, I, uh, he says, you can't mop a rug, can you, big shot? So, so I kind of hemming and hawing, I, I said, I don't know, tell me. So he says, every old plumber had a tool that we kept on the truck when we're going out to a radiant job, and it worked like a charm. He says, first you had to close all the windows to keep the sunlight in from shining in. He says, and then you'd show up with the tool, and you let the tool loose. <laughs> and the tool would walk around on that floor until it found the warmest spot, and it would lay down right on the warm spot. And that's where the leak was every time. <laughs> all you had to do was move the tool, and you'd find a leak. And that, my friends, is the origin of the CAT scan. <laughs> so there you go. Did you have fun? I'm right on time. Thank you. Thank you. So do you have any questions? Before we go to Q&A, just remember this is being recorded, so please wait for the microphone to come to you. Over here. Hello, that was a great talk. Thank you, um, a great audience. I could point out that uh, my parents had a second generation Levitt house where they got rid of the radiant tubing and put in uh, asbestos line to he eat ducks instead. But uh, let's not go into that. Also, I live in the Cherokee, so you had, a, you had us uh, in the first minute of your uh, discussion. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the a, a prehistoric dead end of uh, hydronic heating in the United States. In uh, the 1830s, there was, was uh, a family of American engineers who moved to Britain named the Perkinses. And uh, they developed a hot water heating system basically for radiators. Uh -huh. And John Haviland, who was the architect of several penitentiaries in the United States, uh, including Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, which still exists, and the New Jersey Penitentiary in Trenton, some of which still exist, was concerned with designing central heating systems. And uh, so he bought a system from Perkins and had it imported from Britain. Mm -hmm. And he, he uh, put it in uh, the New Jersey state one, but uh, the state said, okay, we're only going to build two of the five cell blocks right now. So. Uh, Havilland had some extra piping on his hands. And uh, in Eastern State Penitentiary, which he had built before, he used hot air heating, and it failed catastrophically and almost asphyxiated the prisoners. So uh, 
he had all of this extra piping uh, lying around with about a place to put it, and he had a big problem at Eastern State, so he installed it there also, the leftover stuff from Trenton. And he ran it under the floor. Uh, there were wood floors, and he ran it under the wood floors. And basically what he had was one, lining going the, one line going the whole length of the cell block, which was you know 300 feet long, and then looping back and running back again. So he had two pipes under the floor, right in the middle. And so if you knew the pipes were warm, you'd sit right in the middle of the cell, and otherwise you'd freeze. And the uh, problem with it is that uh, with all of the Perkins uh, hot water installations was that the pipe was uh, about an inch in diameter, and within 20 years, they'd be rusted solid. Yes. And that's what happened at Eastern End State, and they took that all out and put in radiant heaters. So it, it, it's a, a prehistoric episode that didn't really lead anywhere, but uh, I, I'm offering it for, for what it's worth. Thank you. It's worth a lot. <laughs> and if anybody, if, if you get to Philadelphia and you visit Eastern State Penitentiary, it's one of the most fascinating tours you'll ever, you'll ever have because it's a real penitentiary. It wasn't there, to, wasn't there to make people better. It was there to punish them. And you could see Al Capone's uh, cell there too, which is fascinating. And, and the pipes that we're talking about. Over here, Jeanette. Now, was Virginia your girlfriend? No, no, Virginia was just, just Virginia. That was just Virginia. I, I just, had yeah, to, no, I just, I just wanted to know. <laughs> yeah. She's a wonderful young lady. Hey, th thanks for hosting this. I came all the way up from Virginia just to see you. And take it up, take it up. Wow, yeah. <laughs> thank you. And I, I, I won't get back to D.C. until 2.30 in the morning. I gotta be at work at seven, but, cause you're coming out of retirement. So wow. quick, quick question thank out, you. Of, out of uh, the Levittown thing. So they use the boiler for domestic water and for heating water? Yeah, it had a tankless coil in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you had to, uh, you had to maintain 180 degree water year round. Got it, got it, got it. It's not the most economical way to do things. <laughs> okay, well, that's it. But you know, back then they, they thought that that was comfortable. And when, when you have people that weren't experiencing comfort at a younger age, it would kind of it'd be like if you had a wedgie and you had it all the time, you wouldn't even notice it after a while. <laughs> now, that's how they were about comfort. They didn't know they were uncomfortable until somebody gave them something more comfortable. They went, oh, yes. <laughs> to what extent was hydronic heating held back by the pump and the invention of the pump in 19, you said 30s, I think 1928. You said. Um, it was, prior to that, it was all gravity hot water heat, which was the simplest system ever, but the most complicated to install and to, and to engineer. But uh, the circulator gets invented at the same time, uh, both here and in Germany. So here it's invented by Homer Thrush. He, he makes the Thrush circulator in and, and 1928, and he, he's working with Mark Honeywell. And in Europe, it's a man named uh, Wilhelm Oplander who starts a company called Velo. W-I-L-O. So they, they just simultaneously invent basically the same thing at the same time. It was just a paradigm shift that, that happened and, uh, and changed everything because suddenly you can have smaller pipes, which made it more economical. Well, there you have it then. No. One more? One more. Okay. Like the rocket What? water gravity. You know, how, the gravity, how come? Your book, how come? Yeah, how come? Yeah. yeah. My son? Mechanical engineer, I made a system. Hot water, we said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna go green. We're gonna circulate water without any circulators, right? wow. electric. So I, I put the, yeah, there we go. Mechanical engineer, A on that project, you know? That's beautiful, he, that's he, great. Yeah, yeah. That's just great. That, and that's why he's here and yeah. just, you know, and I've been following you, I've been a group, you just might not recognize you, but I've been, yeah. I recognize you, books. yeah. At all your books. <laughs> I've, I've got a, a, a buddy in Monterey, California, Larry Weingarten, who's, who's a brilliant guy, and he lives off grid. He built a house, designed it, lives off grid. And it has a gravity-operated radiant heating system in the walls, and, and it works off of solar. And this is the most amazing house in the world. You can, he's been written up in the New York Times about this house. And uh, he was trying to find a fluid that would be non-toxic that he could use in, in place of antifreeze. And what he, what he found, uh, the perfect fluid for gravity-run radiant heating was vodka. So, <laughs> so he filled the whole system with vodka. Where did that get? <laughs> Monterey. <laughs> Honey, I gotta go down and drain the boiler, right? <laughs> I'll see you next week. <laughs>
John, hang on, wait for the mic. You look up Larry Weingarten, W-E-I-N-G-A-R-T-E-N, and uh, just Google that, and the story in the New York Times about that vodka will come up. So, Dan, you, you mentioned that uh, only 11% of the country heats with hydronics or you know, water-based yeah. heating systems. What is the motivation for all the boiler manufacturers and heating products manufacturers to carry on? It's a, well, in, in residential, it's, it's a very profitable non-growth replacement business, um, especially now with the advent of heat pumps coming out, and es especially with the advent of dandelion. Uh, if you're following the news on this, Dandelion is a spinoff of Google's uh, Alphabet company, and they're, they're working right now solely in upstate New York. But Dandelion has figured out a way to, to drill wells very inexpensively with, with rigs that they've, that they've invented that are very small. And they've come up with a packaged uh, geothermal system that, that costs like half of what a traditional geothermal system costs, and it's, it's also very small. And they will come in and, and uh, finance the whole thing for you. So this is like Google money behind it. I, I have been saying for at least the past 10 years, or with the advent of the Nest thermostat, when that came out and, and shook up the whole world of heating, I said, there's going to come a point where either Apple or Google decides they're going to get into the heating business. And that's going to change everything. And now Google is in the, in the heating business. And it's, called, and it's called Dandelion. So there's that, and, and, and of course, commercial. I mean, hydronics now basically is a commercial industrial business, big stuff. And you can see on the, on the boiler manufacturer level, particularly the people that make the modulating condensing type boilers, they're making small boilers that can be teamed with other small boilers to pretty much have capability of, of doing anything with enough boilers. They work together. And they've got these, this turn down where you can make the flame smaller, you know, a hundred times when, when you're working with modular type boilers. So companies like Lockenvar and people like that are doing this sort of thing. And you could, you could just see the way it's going. But it's a commercial business. There's going to be, I mean, you, you just don't see people building housing developments that have hydronic heat. Wait, we're... And this is the last question. <laughs> Actually, I do see a lot of projects, a lot of work we're doing here. Uh, I mean, when people doing developments, of course, it's the cheapest possible materials, you know, the fastest. Yes. And get it done and out, and it's all about the bottom line. But uh, all the projects that we're doing for specific clients, I'd say 75% of jobs we do are have hydronic systems in them. Where do you work? Uh, New York City, New Jersey. Yeah, of course. I, you know, growing up here on Long Island and, and in Manhattan, I really thought that the whole world was heated hydronically. But then when I became this uh, speaker, you know, I mean, I literally, I, I've spoken in Europe, I've spoken in Hawaii, I've spoken in the Caribbean, in Canada, Alaska. You cross that river and you, you don't see hydronics again until you get to to uh, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, and then you don't see it after that until you get to Denver, and then you don't see it till you get to Seattle. Huh. And that's, that's where it is, but everything else is either geothermal now or it's, or it's gas-fired, yeah. forced air. Yeah, I'm saying a lot of people care about their air quality in the house and they, wanna, they don't want to deal yeah. with that dry air. And, and, and P.S., the Mayor de Blasio is now pushing to have all the steam heating in New York City removed, including single-family homes. He wants to mandate this, get rid of all the steam heating, because it's, it's uh, inefficient. And they want to replace it with, with P-tax, like you have in a hotel room. Right? Now, we start putting these into apartment buildings Who's going to change the wiring so that we don't burn the building down? And can we make enough electricity to run all these things? I, I contacted them about this building because we made some relatively minor changes here for not a lot of expense, and we lowered the Con Ed bill by 43%. And I said, do you want to learn about that, how that was done? And they said, no, we've made up our mind already. So there you go. So I don't think it's achievable what he wants to do, but this is what they're talking about. And he's talking about mandates now. 
Thank you. And uh, go have a glass of wine. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Dan, thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Karen. really, uh, this is like another, uh, such a treat to have Dan come and speak here again, and Dan, you took us in this, uh, um, you took us through the development of radiating, radiant, radiant heating from the Romans to the 21st century and 22nd century, and it was absolutely fascinating. And again, I'm always struck how you present um, your information in the most entertaining and eloquent way. So thank you so much. And normally, we make a presentation at this point uh, at, with a certificate, a library card, but Dan has warned us against any of it. Well, but we really can't because we, Dan's a brother. Uh, he is our vice president of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. So we're doing everything that we can so he doesn't use that word retirement again. <laughs> but we're going to talk him out of it, so don't worry, you'll all be back. And thank you to everyone who, who came this evening. I got to give a special shout out to you, drove from Virginia. That is so. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And just and I'll just close by saying that Dan Hollihan, we've you know, he's been here for three years. It feels like so much more than that, and we really don't know what we would do without him. He's wonderful. Oh, thank so thank you. You. Thank, you. thank you. And thank all, all of you for coming. All right.